It is indeed a great pleasure to be back in Leipzig and talking about Hegel. Hegel opens the first paragraph of his introduction to the phenomenology of spirit by introducing his model of cognitive faculties, the one that he supposes will be most familiar to his readers in its Kantian form. He says, knowledge tends to be regarded as the instrument through which one takes hold of the absolute, or as the medium through which one discovers it. He thinks that no account that has this general shape can meet the most basic epistemological criteria of adequacy. By showing that, he hopes to make his readers appreciate the need for an alternative model, which he will then supply in the rest of the book. The general character of his complaint against construing cognitive faculties on the instrument or medium model seems clear enough. He offers a twofold summary. That model leads first to the conviction that there's an absurdity in the concept of even beginning a process of knowledge designed to gain for consciousness that which is in itself. And second, that there's a strict line of demarcation separating knowledge and the absolute. The first objection alleges that theories of the sort he's addressing must lead to some kind of skepticism, a failure to make intelligible the idea of knowing how things are in themselves, how they really are. The second complaint points to a diagnosis of the reason for this failure. The model excavates a kind of gulf separating consciousness from what it's consciousness of. And he expands on both these points. He fills in his charge that instrument or medium theories lead to skepticism by saying, if knowledge is the instrument to take hold of the absolute essence, one is immediately reminded that the application of an instrument to a thing does not leave the thing as it is, but brings about a shaping or an alteration of it. Or if knowledge is not an instrument for our activity, but a more or less passive medium through which the light of truth reaches us, then again, we do not receive this truth as it is in itself, but as it is in and through this medium. In both cases, we employ a means which immediately brings about the opposite of its own end, or rather the absurdity lies in our making use of any means at all. In either case, he thinks, there's gonna be a distinction between what things are for consciousness, the product of the exercise of cognitive faculties, and what they are in themselves, the raw materials on which the cognitive faculties are exercised. Something about the character of this distinction, Hegel seems to be arguing, is incompatible with what things are for consciousness, according to such a picture, counting as genuine knowledge of how things really are, in themselves, as he puts it. He elaborates the problem diagnosed in the second part of the last passage. He says it is that the instrument or medium picture, quote, presupposes notions about knowledge as an instrument and a medium, and also the notion that there's a difference between ourselves and this knowledge. But above all, it presupposes that the absolute stands on one side and that knowledge, though it, knowledge of it is on the other side for itself and separated from the absolute, but is nevertheless something real. Hence, it assumes that knowledge may be true besides its despite its presupposition that knowledge is outside the absolute and therewith outside the truth as well. By taking the position, what, it calls, what calls itself the fear of error reveals itself as the fear of truth. It's apparently of the essence of the instrument or medium model to see such a difference, a separation, to see two sides of one divide and to understand the job of cognitive faculties to consist in bridging that divide, in overcoming that gulf. The argument there seems to be that if there is a gulf separating how things are in themselves from how they are for consciousness, that would require the operation of some cognitive faculties to bridge it or reunite the two sides, then all that an investigation of those faculties can do is reinstitute the gulf or the separation. I think we can see in these passages the general shape of an argument, but it's hazy, and it's hard to discern both the exact outlines of the class of views that it targets and just how the criticism of them is supposed to work. 
The haziness of the argument is due partly to the compression of the exposition. I've actually quoted most of what he says about it. And partly, I think, to the metaphorical terms in terms of, in, uh, in terms of which it's conducted, the talk about medium, uh, the talk about instruments. To fill in the details, one would need to do four things. One would have to specify what criteria of adequacy for epistemological theories Hegel is insisting on. Second, what class of theories he claims can't satisfy those criteria. Third, what features of those theories are responsible for that failure. And fourth, exactly how the argument for that conclusion works. In the rest of this lecture, I'm going to offer one way of sharpening the argument that Hegel's putting on the table here along these four dimensions, and an initial characterization of the shape of the alternative model that Hegel proposes to replace instrument or medium models. I think that to get a better specification of the range of epistemological theories that fall within the target area of Hegel's argument, what he's metaphorically labeled the instrument or medium model, it'll help to start further back. The theories he's addressing are representational theories of the relation between appearance and reality. And representation is a distinctively modern concept. Pre-modern, originally Greek theories, understood the relations between appearance and reality not in terms of representation, but in terms of resemblance. Resemblance, paradigmatically one of the relations between a picture and what it pictures, is a matter of sharing properties. A portrait resembles the one portrayed insofar as it shares with its objects properties of color and shape. For instance, the color and shape of the nose, the ear, and the chin, perhaps as seen from some perspective. The thought behind the resemblance model is that appearance is veridical insofar as it resembles the reality that it's an appearance of. Insofar as it does not resemble that reality, it's a false appearance, an error. This was a very intuitive picture, but the rise of modern science made it unsustainable. Copernicus discovered that the reality behind the appearance of a stationary Earth and a moving sun was a stationary sun and a rotating Earth. No resemblance no shared properties there. The relationship between reality and its appearance has to be understood in some more complicated way. Galileo produces a massively productive and effective way of conceiving physical reality in which periods of time show up as the lengths of lines and the accelerations of objects show up as the areas of triangles. The model of resemblance is simply of no help in understanding this crucial form of appearance. The notion of shared property that would, have to, that would apply would have to be understood itself in terms of relations between this sort of mathematized, geometrized, theoretical appearance and the reality it's an appearance of. There's no antecedently available concept of property in terms of which a notion of resemblance could be used to understand that relationship. Descartes came up with, with more abstract meta-concepts of representation required to make sense of these scientific achievements and of his own. The particular case he generalized from to get a new model of the relations between appearance and reality, between mind and world, is the relationship he discovered between algebra and geometry. For he discovered how to deploy algebra as a massively productive and effective appearance of what, following Galileo, he still took to be an essentially geometrical physical reality. Treating something in linear discursive form, such as AX plus BY equals C, as an appearance of a Euclidean line, and X squared plus Y squared equals D as an appearance of a circle, allows one to calculate how many points of intersection they can have and what points of intersection they do have, and lots more besides. But those sequences of symbols do not at all resemble lines and circles. Yet Descartes' mathematical results, including solving a substantial number of geometrical problems that had gone unsolved since antiquity by translating them into algebraic questions, showed that algebraic symbols presenting geometrical facts in a form that's not only potentially and reliably veridical, but conceptually tractable. 
in order to understand how strings of algebraic symbols could be useful veridical, tractable appearances of geometrical realities, Descartes needed a new way of conceiving the relations between appearance and reality. His philosophical response to the scientific and mathematical advances in understanding of this intellectually turbulent and exciting time was the development of a concept of representation that was much more abstract, powerful, and flexible than the, representation, than the resemblance model that it supplanted. He saw that what made algebraic understanding of geometrical figures possible was what we would call a global isomorphism between the whole system of algebraic symbols and the whole system of geometrical figures. That isomorphism defined a notion of form shared by the licit manipulations of strings of algebraic symbols and the constructions possible with geometrical figures. In the context of such an isomorphism, the particular material properties of what now become intelligible as representings and representeds become irrelevant to the semantic relation between them. All that matters is the correlation between the rules governing the manipulation of the representings and the actual possibilities that characterize the representeds. Inspired then by the newly emerging forms of modern scientific understanding, Descartes concluded that this representational relation, of which resemblance then shows up as only a primitive species, he saw this representational relation as the key to understanding the relations between mind and world, appearance and reality, quite generally. This was a fabulous tra tradition transforming idea and essentially everything that Western philosophers have thought since, no less on the practical than on the theoretical side, is downstream from it, conceptually and not just temporally, and whether we realize it or not. But Descartes combined this idea with another more problematic one. This is the idea that if any things are to be known or understood representationally, whether correctly or not, by being represented, then there must be some things that are known or understood non-representationally, immediately, not by the mediation of representings. If representings, he thought, could only be known representationally by being themselves in turn represented, then a vicious infinite regress would result. For we would only be able to know about a represented thing by knowing about a representing of it, and could only count as knowing about it if we already knew about a representing of it, and so on. In a formulation that was only extracted explicitly centuries later by Josiah Royce, if even error is to be possible, if even misrepresentation is to be possible, never mind knowledge, then there must be something about which error is not possible, something we know about not by representing it, so that error in the sense of misrepresentation is not possible. If we can know or be wrong about anything representationally by means of the mediation of representings of it, there must, he thought, be some representings that we grasp, understand, or know about immediately, simply by having them. The result for Descartes was a two-stage representational theory that sharply distinguished between two kinds of things based on their intrinsic intelligibility. Some things, paradigmatically physical, material, extended things, can by their nature only be known by being represented. Other things, paradigmatically the contents of our own minds, are by nature representings and are known in another way entirely. They're known immediately, not by being represented, but just by being had, just by being there. They're intrinsically intelligible, in that their mere matter-of-factual occurrence counts as knowing or understanding something. Things that are by nature knowable only as represented are not, in this sense, intrinsically intelligible. Their occurrence does not entail that anyone knows or understands anything, even about representings. As I've indicated, I think Descartes was driven to this picture by two demands. On the one hand, making sense of the new theoretical, mathematized, scientific forms in which reality could appear, the best and most efficacious forms of understanding of his time. That required a new, more abstract notion of representation, 
and the idea that it's by an appropriate way of representing things that we know and understand them best. So we must distinguish between representings and representeds and worry about the relation between them in virtue of which manipulating the one sort of thing counts as knowing or understanding the other sort of thing. On the other hand, such a two-stage model is threatened with unintelligibility in the forming of a looming infinite regress of explanation if we don't distinguish between how we know representeds, namely by means of our relations of, to representings of them, and how we know at least some representings, namely immediately, at least not by being related to representings of them. The re result was a two-stage model in which we're immediately related to some representings and in virtue of their relation to representeds, stand in a mediated cognitive relation to those represented things. The representings must be understood as intrinsically and immediately intelligible, and the representeds as only intelligible in a derivative compositional sense, as the result of the product of our immediate relations to representings and their relations then to representeds. I want to say that this is the structure of the epistemological model that Hegel takes as his target in those opening remarks in the introduction to the phenomenology. What he's objecting to is two-stage representational theories that are committed to a fundamental difference in intelligibility between appearances, representings, how things are for consciousness, on the one hand, and reality, represented, how things are in themselves, on the other hand according to which the former are immediately and intrinsically intelligible and the latter are not. This gulf, what Hegel calls the difference, the separation, the two sides of one divide separating appearance and reality, knowing and the known, that he complains about is this gulf of intelligibility. Hegel's critical claim is that any theory of this form is doomed to yield skeptical results. Of course, Descartes' view isn't the only one Hegel means to be criticizing. For Kant, too, has a two-stage representational theory. Cognitive activity needs to be understood as the product of both the mind's activities of manipulating representations in the sense of representings and the relation those representings stand in to what they represent. Both what the mind does with its representations and how they're related to what they represent must be considered in apportioning responsibility for features of those representings to the things represented, <coughs> as specified in a vocabulary that does not invoke either the mind's manipulation of representations or the relations between representings and representeds. That is, things as they are in themselves, an sich, or to the representational relations and what the cognitive faculties do with and to representings. The latter, for Kant, yields what the represented things are for consciousness, in Hegel's terminology, namely contentful representings. Kant's theory is not, to be sure, the same as Descartes, but it shares the two-stage representational structure that distinguishes the mind's relation to its representings and its relation to representeds that's mediated by those representings. Although Kant does sometimes seem to think that we have a special kind of access to the products of our own cognitive activity, he certainly does not think of our awareness of our representings as immediate in any recognizably Cartesian sense. Awareness is apperception, and the minimal unit of apperception is judgment. To judge, for Kant, is to integrate a conceptually articulated content into a constellation of commitments that exhibits the distinctive synthetic unity of apperception. Doing that is extruding from the constellation commitments incompatible with the judgment being made and extracting from it inferential consequences that are then added to the constellation of commitments. This is a process that's mediated by the relations of material incompatibility and consequence that relate the concepts being applied in the judgment to the concepts applied in other judgments. So Kant shares with Descartes the two-stage representational structure, but does not take over the idea that our relation to our own representations is one of immediate awareness. 
His view still falls within the range of Hegel's criticisms, however, because Kant maintains the differential intelligibility of representings and representeds. Representings are as such intelligibility, and what is represented is, as such, not. I'll call this commitment to a strong differential intelligibility of appearance and reality. The claim that the one is the right sort of thing to be intelligible and the other is not. Kant has a new model of intelligibility. To be intelligible is to have a content articulated by concepts. It's the concepts applied in an act of awareness of apperception that determine what would count as successfully integrating, he says synthesizing, that judgment into a whole exhibiting the unity distinctive of apperception. But the conceptual articulation of judgments is a, form of is a form of representings contributed by the cognitive faculty of the understanding. It's not something we can know or assume to characterize what is represented by those conceptual representings, when those representeds are considered apart from their relation to such representings, that is, as they are in themselves. Now, of course, what's represented for Kant, we need to keep two sets of books. I'm running through this very uh, quickly and crudely. On Hegel's reading, Kant is committed to a gulf of intelligibility, separating our representings from what the representings are, from what they are representings of, from what is represented as it is in itself. In the form of the view that the representings are in conceptual shape, and what things are in themselves is not. Just to remind ourselves how much it's, is at stake in Hegel's criticism of two-stage representational theories of the relations between appearance and reality that are committed to the differential intelligibility of the relata, it's worth thinking in this connection about Frege. For Frege, discursive symbols express a sense, a zin and thereby designate a referent, a bedeutung. Senses are what is grasped when one understands the expression, and the referents are what are thereby represented, what expressing that sense is talking or thinking about. A sense is a representing in that it's a mode of presentation, out des Gegebenseins, of a referent. No more than Kant does Frege construe grasp of a sense as immediate in a Cartesian sense, according to which the mere occurrence of something with that sense counts as the mind's knowing or understanding something. Grasping a judgeable content rather requires mastering the inferential and substitutional relation, relations it stands in to, such, to other such contents. But like Descartes and Kant, Frege thinks that grasping senses understanding representations as representations does not require representing them in turn, and that representings in the sense of senses are graspable in a sense in which what they represent is not, apart from special cases of indirect discourse. So if, as I've claimed, Hegel's argument is intended to be directed at two-stage representational models committed to treating representings as intelligible in a sense in which representeds in general are not, then it seems that Phrygian sense reference theories, as well as the Kantian and Cartesian versions, will have to count as among the targets of Hegel's argument. So the stakes are high. In order to see whether there's an argument of the sort Hegel's after that tells against all theories of this kind, that is, all two-stage representational theories that are committed to a strong differential intelligibility of representings and representeds, we must next think about what criteria of adequacy for such theories Hegel is appealing to. In general, we know that what Hegel thinks is wrong with them is that they lead to skepticism. Further, he tells us that what he means by this is that such theories preclude, preclude knowing things as they are in themselves, as he says. I think part of what's going on here is that Hegel learned from Kant that the soft underbelly of epistemological theories is the semantics they implicitly incorporate and depend upon. And he thinks that two-stage representational theories committed to the strong differential intelligibility of representings and what they represent 
semantically preclude genuine knowledge of those representing, represented. I'll call the criterion of adequacy on epistemological theories that Hegel is invoking here the genuine knowledge condition. Obviously, a lot turns on what counts as genuine knowledge. But it's clear in any case that this requirement demands that an epistemological theory not be committed to a semantics, in particular a theory of representation, that when looked at closely enough turns out to rule out as unintelligible the very possibility of knowing how things really are. That's what we're calling genuine knowledge. I don't take it that the very existence of a contrast between how we know what's represented and how we know representings by itself demonstrates such a failure. Hegel's specific claim is that when that difference is construed as one of intelligibility in the strong sense, representings are intrinsically intelligible and representeds are not, then skepticism about genuine knowledge is a consequence. And he takes from Kant the idea that intelligibility is a matter of conceptual articulation. To be intelligible is to be specifically in conceptual shape. If this reading is correct, then Hegel's argument must show that to satisfy the genuine knowledge condition, an epistemological theory must treat not only appearance, how things subjectively are for consciousness, but also reality, how things objectively are in themselves as conceptually articulated. Again, what could count as a good argument for this claim obviously turns on what's required to satisfy that requirement. Both resemblance and representation models of the relations between appearance and reality have a story about what error consists in. That's what happens when antecedently intelligible properties are not shared, so that resemblance breaks down or when there are local breakdowns in the globally defined isomorphism between the system of representings and representeds. In the middle paragraphs of the introduction, in which Hegel begins to present his alternative to two-stage representational epistemological theories committed to the strong differential intelligibility of representings and representeds, the treatment of error looms large. I think we can take it as an implicit criterion of adequacy Hegel is imposing on epistemological theories, that they make intelligible the phenomenon not only of genuine knowledge, but also of error. I'll call this the intelligibility of error condition. The genuine knowledge condition and the intelligibility of error condition are epistemological constraints. The semantics presupposed by or implicit in an epistemological theory must not preclude the intelligibility either of genuine knowledge or of error, being wrong, about how things, being wrong about how things really are or being right. We must be able to understand both what it is for, for what there is to appear as it is and what it is for it to appear as it is not. An epistemological theory that does not make both of these intelligible is not adequate to the phenomenon of our efforts to know and understand how things really are. Approaching epistemology from this semantic direction suggests that behind these epistemological constraints are deeper semantic ones. And I think that's in fact the case here. We can't read these off of Hegel's extremely telegraphic remarks in the text of the opening paragraphs of the introduction, but must, I think, infer them from the solution he ultimately proposes to the challenges that he sets out there. First is what we could looking over our shoulders at Frege, called the mode of presentation condition. This is the requirement that, that appearances, representings, Fregean senses, must be essentially, and not just accidentally, appearances of some purported realities. One does not count as having properly grasped an appearing unless one grasps it as the appearance of something. When all goes well, Grasping the appearance must count as a way of knowing about what it's an appearance of. Appearances must make some reality semantically visible or otherwise accessible. The claim is not that one ought not to reify appearances, think of them as things, but rather, for instance, adverbially, say, in terms of being appeared to thusly. That's not a silly thought, but that's not the present point. 
The present point is that if the epistemological genuine knowledge condition is to be satisfied by a two-stage representational model, representings must be semantic presentations of represented's in a robust sense, in which what one has grasped is not a representation unless it's grasped as the representing of some represented. Further along, we'll see how Hegel, following Kant, understands this requirement. Taking or treating something in practice as a representing is taking or treating it as subject to a distinctive kind of normative assessment as to its correctness, in such a way that what thereby counts as represented serves as a standard for normative assessments of correctness. A second semantic constraint on epistemological theories that I take to be implicitly in play in Hegel's understanding of the epistemological genuine knowledge condition is that if the representational relation is to be understood semantically in a way that can support genuine knowledge, it must portray what is represented as exerting rational constraint on representings of it. That is, how it is with what is represented must, when the representation relation is not defective, provide a reason for the representing to be as it is. What we're talking or thinking about must be able to provide reasons for what we say or think about it. We can call this the rational constraint condition. Although he does not argue for this constraint in the introduction, I think in many ways it's the key premise for the argument that Hegel does offer. The thought is that the difference between merely responding differentially to the presence or absence of a fact or property and comprehending it, having thoughts that are representationally about it in the sense that if everything goes well, counts as knowledge of it, depends on the possibility of that fact or property being able to serve for the knower as a reason for having a belief or making a commitment. The central sort of semantic aboutness depends on being able rationally to take in how things are, in the sense of taking them in as providing reasons for our attitudes, which in virtue of that rational accountability then count as being about how those things are. Hegel learns from Kant to think about representation in normative terms. What is represented exercises a distinctive kind of authority over representings. Representings are responsible to what they represent. What's represented serves as a kind of authoritative normative standard for assessments of the correctness of what count as representings of it, whether correct or incorrect, just in virtue of being subject to assessments of their correctness in which those represented serve as the standard. The rational constraint condition adds that the standard, what's represented, must provide reasons for those assessments. In fact, in the context of Kant's and Hegel's view, this is not a further commitment, for neither of them distinguishes between norms or rules and norms or rules that are rational in the sense of being conceptually articulated. For them, all norms are understood just as conceptual norms. Norms and rules, or concepts, are just two ways of talking about the same topic. Conceptual norms are norms that determine what's a reason for what. For a norm to be contentful is for it to have conceptual content, a matter of what it can be a reason for or against, and what can be a reason for or against it. This is the only kind of content they acknowledge. The German idealists are rationalists about norms in that the norms or rules are contentful exclusively in the sense of being conceptually contentful, determining what counts as a reason for what. The rational constraint condition accordingly fills in the sense of representation or aboutness on which the mode of presentation condition depends. And these two semantic conditions provide the crucial criteria of adequacy for satisfying the two epistemological conditions, the genuine knowledge condition and the intelligibility of error condition. For the intelligibility of genuine knowledge of or error about how things really are turns on the rational normative constraint those realities exert on what counts as appearances or representings of those realities just insofar as they're subject to normative assessments of those of correctness and incorrectness, knowledge or error, 
in which those realities serve as the standard in the sense of providing reasons for those assessments. Supposing that these four conditions represent the, relative, the relevant criteria of adequacy for epistemological theories and their implicit semantics, what is Hegel's argument against two-stage representational theories that are committed to a strong difference of intelligibility between representings and representeds, between appearance and reality? Why can't theories of this form satisfy the four criteria of adequacy I've teased out? It's characteristic of two-stage theories, not just Descartes, but those of Kant and Frege, that they incorporate a distinction between two ways of knowing or understanding things. Some things are known only representationally by being represented. Other things, at least some representings, according to the regress argument, are known non-representationally in some way other than by being represented in their turn. If we're interested in investigating cognitive faculties in the context of theories like this, then we're interested in the representation relation. For cognitive faculties are the instrument or medium that produces representings of the real. But then we must ask, is the representational relation, the relation between representings and what they represent, itself something that is known only representationally, or is it something that can be known non-representationally? If it's itself something that's knowable or intelligible only by being represented, then it seems again we're embarked on a vicious regress, this time a Bradleyan regress that's a successor to the one Descartes was worried about. The epistemological enterprise is not intelligible unless we can make sense of the relation between representations of representational relations and those representational relations themselves. Until we've grasped all of an infinite chain of representings, of representings, of representings, of the relation between representings and representeds, we're not in a position to understand the representational relation, and hence not the instrument or medium of representation. Semantic skepticism, skepticism about what it is so much as to purport to represent anything, must then be the result. This argument is essentially the Cartesian regress of representation argument to the conclusion that there must be non-representational knowledge of representings, applied now not to the representings, but to the representational relations they stand in to what they represent. Again, if we know those only representationally, we're embarked on a vicious infinite regress. So if epistemology and so knowledge is to be intelligible, it seems that within this sort of framework, we must embrace the other horn of the dilemma and take it that the representation relation is something that can itself be known or understood non-representationally. That in this respect, it belongs in a box with the representations or appearances themselves. Responding this way to the dilemma concerning our understanding of the representational relation is in effect acknowledging the mode of presentation condition for it's saying that part of our non-representational understanding of appearances, of representings, must be understanding them as appearances, as representings of something. Their representational properties, their ofness, what Descartes called them being tanquam rem, as if of things, their relations to what they at least purport to represent must be intelligible in the same sense in which the representings are. The rational constraint condition says that for appearances to be intelligible as appearances, representings, modes of presentation of something, they must be intelligible as rationally constrained by what they then count as representing. This means that what's represented must be intelligible as providing reasons for assessments of correctness and incorrectness of appearances or representings. Reasons are things that can be thought or said, things that can be cited as reasons. For instance, reasons for an assessment of a representing as correct or incorrect, as amounting to knowledge or error. And that's to say that what provides reasons for such assessments must itself, no less than the assessment, 
be in conceptual form. Giving reasons for undertaking a commitment, for instance, to an assessment of correctness or incorrectness, is endorsing a sample piece of reasoning, an inference, in which the premises provide good reasons for the commitment. It's to exhibit premises, the endorsement of which entitle one to the conclusion. So the reasons, no less than what they're reasons for, must be conceptually articulated. Put another way, appearances are to be intelligible, graspable, in the sense that they're conceptually articulated. Understanding the judgment that things are thus and so requires knowing what concepts are being applied and understanding those concepts. One only does that insofar as one practically masters their role in reasoning, what their applicability provides reasons for and against, and the applicability of what other concepts would provide reasons for or against their applicability. If the relation between appearances and the realities they're appearances of, what they represent, how they represent things as being, is to be intelligible in the same sense that the appearances themselves are, so that the regress of representation is avoided, this must be because that relation itself is a conceptual relation, a relation among concepts or concept applications, a relation between things that are conceptually articulated. The conclusion is that if the rational constraint condition must be satisfied in order to satisfy the genuine knowledge condition and the intelligibility of error condition, if the rational constraint condition is a semantically necessary condition on satisfying those epistemological criteria of adequacy, perhaps because it's a necessary condition of satisfying the mode of presentation condition, which itself is a necessary semantic condition on satisfying the epistemological genuine knowledge and intelligibility of error condition, then those conditions cannot be satisfied by a two-stage representational theory that's committed to the strong differential intelligibility of, repre of representing and represented. If not only representings, but the representation relation must be intelligible in a sense that requires their conceptual articulation, then both ends of the representation relation must be conceptually contentful. Only in that way is it intelligible how what's represented can exert rational constraint on repre representings in the sense of providing reasons for assessments of their correctness or incorrectness. Now, I've been working to find a structure beneath what appears on the telegraphic metaphor-laden surface of the text of the opening paragraphs of Hegel's introduction. And I claim so far only to have sketched a potentially colorable argument. Further exploration is required, in particular of the reasons for accepting the rational constraint condition which this exposition reveals as the principal load-bearing premise of the argument. A key component in that enterprise would be clarifying the concepts of conceptual articulation and conceptual content, for that's what the rational constraint condition says must characterize both representing and represented, which commitment to a representational theory with strong difference of intelligibility denies. It'll help to begin on this task by looking at what sorts of theories might be thought to be available once the strong difference of intelligibility of appearance and reality has been denied. That is, once one is committed to not excavating a gulf of intelligibility between representings and what they represent. One place to begin is with Frege's proposed definition in the thought. A fact, he says, is a thought that is true. Thoughts, for Frege, are the senses of declarative sentences. They're claims, in the sense of claimable contents, rather than claim acts of claiming. A fact, he says, is not something that corresponds to or is represented by such a sense. It just is such a sense, one that's true. Facts, for Frege, are a subset of claimables, of senses, of representings, of things that are cognitively, uh, that can cognitively appear. I take it, though, that Frege retains the two-stage representational model for the relation between senses and their reference, for thoughts and truth values. And this matters for what he thinks senses are, 
namely modes of presentation of reference. But as far as the relation between thoughts and facts are concerned, he doesn't appeal to such a model. Again, Wittgenstein says, when we say and mean that such and such is the case, we and our meaning do not stop anywhere short of the fact, but we mean this is so. This is from 195 of the investigations. It's my colleague John McDowell's favorite Wittgenstein quotation. That's at the center of his thought. In these cases, the content of what we say, our meaning, is the fact. Such an approach is sometimes talked about under the heading of an identity theory of truth, uh, though McDowell does not like to call it that. On such an approach, there is no principled gulf of intelligibility between appearance and reality, mind and world. Because when all goes well, the appearance inherit their content from the realities their appearances of. Thoughts, in the sense of thinkings, can share their content with the true thoughts in the sense of thinkables that are the facts they represent. Representings are distinct from representeds, so the two-stage representational model is still endorsed, but they're understood as two forms in which one content can be manifested. What is most striking about views of this stripe is that they're committed to the claim, as McDowell puts it in Mind and World, that the conceptual has no outer boundary. What is thinkable is identified with what's conceptually contentful. But the objective facts, no less than the subjective thinkings and claimings about them, are understood as already in conceptual shape. Indeed, the early Wittgenstein, no less than the later, already thought of things this way. The world is everything that is the case. It's the totality of facts. And what is the case can be said of it. Facts are essentially, and not just accidentally, things that can be stated, things that can be thought. Views with these consequences provide a very friendly environment in which to satisfy the rational constraint condition. And so, in the context of a suitable Kantian normative understanding of aboutness, the mode of presentation condition on understandings of the relations between cognitive appearances and the realities of which they are appearances. The defensibility and plausibility of this sort of approach depend principally on the details of the understanding of the meta-concept of the conceptual, conceptual contentfulness, conceptual articulation, in terms of which it's articulated. For on some such conceptions, it's extremely implausible and indeed indefensible. For instance, if one's understanding of concepts is ultimately psychological, then the idea that thoughts in the sense of thinkings or believings, and facts, the idea that they and facts might have the same conceptual content, would have undesirable consequences. If one thinks that what is in the first instance conceptually contentful is believings and thinkings, and that other things, such as visual and auditory sign designs, marks and noises, can count as conceptually contentful only at one remove by being expressions of beliefs and thoughts, then the claim that the fact that those beliefs and thoughts, and derivatively marks and noises, express when all goes well, are themselves conceptually contentful, threatens to make the existence of those facts objectionably dependent on the existence of thinkings and believings. The same sort of unfortunate implication results from conjoining the rational constraint condition of the mode of presentation condition with Donald Davidson's claim that only a belief can justify another belief. Barclay claims that the only things we can intelligibly be understood to represent by our thoughts are other thoughts, the thoughts of God. Some of the British idealists thought that the reality that appeared to us in thought and belief consisted of the thought of the absolute and thought they'd learned that lesson from Hegel. More recently, Derrida, using de Saussure's conceptually pre-Kantian and pre-Phrygian terminology, offers a picture of a world consisting only of signifiers, with the only things available to be signified being further signifiers. At this point, things have clearly gone badly wrong. All these arguments involve ignoring what Sellers calls the notorious ing-ed ambiguity, which turns on the distinction between thoughts and beliefs in the sense of acts of thinking and believing 
and thoughts and beliefs in the sense of what is thinkable or believable. If Hegel's opening argument has to be filled in in a way that has this sort of idealism as its consequence, then we ought to exploit it by modus tollens and not modus ponens. In fact, though, Hegel's idea is that the criteria of adequacy for accounts of the relations between appearance and reality that underlie his argument can be satisfied without untoward consequences in the context of quite a different, wholly non-psychological conception of conceptual contentfulness. The kind of idealism that would require a world thinker on the objective side, no less than a finite thinker on the subjective side, is indeed, for Hegel as for the rest of us, a reductio. But what it should lead us to reject is not the claim that two-stage representational theories must avoid making strong distinctions of intelligibility between representings and representants. Sorry, but what it should lead us to reject is the claim that we shouldn't make strong distinctions of intelligibility. We shouldn't conjoin that view with a particular conception of conceptual articulation, namely a psychological one. But what alternative is there? Hegel gets his concept of conceptual content from thinking about Kant's theory of judgment and taking on board his understanding of concepts as functions of judgment. Kant understands judging in normative and pragmatic terms. On the normative side, he understands judging as committing oneself, as taking responsibility for something, as endorsing a judged content. On the pragmatic side, he understands these normative doings in practical terms, as a matter of what one is committed or responsible for doing. What one is responsible for doing is integrating the endorsed content into a constellation of other commitments that exhibits the distinctive unity of apperception. Doing that, synthesizing the unity, is extruding from the dynamically evolving unity commitments that are materially incompatible with the new commitment and extracting and endorsing, so adding commitments that are its material consequences. Judging that P, for Kant, is committing oneself to integrating P with what one is already committed to, synthesizing a new constellation exhibiting that rational unity characteristic of apperception. From Hegel's point of view, that extrusion or expulsion of incompatible commitments and extraction of and expansion according to consequential commitments is the inhalation and exhalation, the breathing rhythm by which a rational subject lives and develops. Synthesizing an, a normative subject, which must exhibit the synthetic unity distinctive of apperception, is a rational process because if one judgment is materially incompatible with another, it serves as a reason against endorsing the other. And if one judgment has another as a material inferential consequence, it serves as a reason for endorsing the other. Understanding the activity of judging in terms of synthesis by integration into a rational unity of apperception requires the judgeable contents stand to one another in relations of material incompatibility and consequence. For it's such relations that normatively constrain the apperceptive process of synthesis, determining what counts as a proper or successful fulfilling of the judging subject's integrative task responsibility or commitment. Concepts, as functions of judgment, determine what counts as a reason for or against their applicability and what their applicability counts as a reason for or against. Since this is true of all concepts, not just formal or logical ones, the incompatibility and inferential consequence relations the concepts determine must in general be understood as material, that is, as having to do with the non-logical content of the concepts, not just logical having to do with their logical form. I've introduced the idea of conceptual content as articulated by relations of material incompatibility and consequence in Kantian terms of the norms such contents impose on the process of judgment understood as rational integration. They're providing standards for the normative assessment of such integration as correct or successful settling what one has committed oneself to do or made one res oneself responsible for doing in endorsing a judgeable content. But I also said that Hegel's notion of conceptual content 
is not in any sense a psychological one. One could mean by that claim that what articulates conceptual content is normative relations, a matter of what one ought to do rather than something that can be read immediately off of what one actually does or is disposed to do. That distinction is indeed of the essence for Kant and for Hegel. But in Hegel's hands, this approach to conceptual content shows itself to be non-psychological in a much more robust sense. For he sees that it characterizes not only the process of thinking on the subjective side of the intentional nexus, but also what's thought about on the objective side. For objective properties, and so the facts concerning which objects exhibit which properties, also stand in relations of material incompatibility and consequence. Natural science, paradigmatically Newton's physics, reveals objective properties and facts as standing to one another in lawful relations of exclusion and consequence. The two bodies subject to no other forces collide is materially, non-logically, that is because of the laws of nature, incompatible with their accelerations not changing. That the acceleration of a massive object is changed has as a material consequence, that is it lawfully necessitates, that a force has been applied to it. In the first case, the two ways the world could, could be do not just contrast with one another, they don't just differ, it's impossible, so Newtonian physics, not logic, tells us, hence physically impossible that both should be facts. And in the second case, it's physically necessary, as a matter of the laws of physics, that if a fact of the first kind were to obtain, so would a fact of the second kind. It follows that if by conceptual we mean, with Hegel, standing in relations of material incompatibility and consequence, then the objective facts and properties natural science reveals as physical reality are themselves always already in physical shape. They're always already in conceptual shape. Modal realism, the claim that some states of affairs necessitate others and make others impossible, the acknowledgement of the laws of nature entails conceptual realism in this sense. It entails the claim that the way the world objectively is, is conceptually articulated. This is a non-psychological conception of the conceptual in a robust sense, because having conceptual content, standing in relations of material incompatibility and consequence, does not require anyone to think or believe anything. If Newton's laws are true, then they held before there were thinkers, and would hold even if there never were thinkers. The facts governed by those laws, for instance, early collisions of particles, stood in lawful relations of relative impossibility and consequential necessity to other possible facts. And hence, on this conception of the conceptual, had conceptual content quite independently of whether any subjective processes of thinking had gone on, were going on, or ever would go on in this or any other possible world. Hegel thinks that underlying this point about the conceptual character of objective reality is a deeper one. For he thinks that the idea of determinateness itself is to be understood in terms of standing in relations of incompatibility and consequence to other things that are determinate in the same sense. He endorses Spinoza's principle, omnis determinatio est negatio. For something to be determinate is for it to be one way rather than another. This thought is incorporated in the 20th century concept of information due to Claude Shannon, which understands information in terms of the partition each bit of information establishes between how things are, according to the information, and how they were not. Everyone would agree, I take it, that if a property does not contrast with any properties, if it is not even different from them, then it's indeterminate. To know such an object had such a property would be to know nothing about it. Beginning already in the perception chapter of the phenomenology, Hegel argues that determinateness requires more than mere difference from other things. It requires what he calls exclusive, ausschließend difference, and not merely indifferent, gleichgültig difference. 
Square and circular are exclusively different properties, since possession by a plane figure of one excludes, rules out, or is materially incompatible with possession of the other. Square and green are merely or indifferently different, in that though they are distinct properties, possession of the one does not preclude possession of the other. An essential part of the determinate content of a property, what makes it the property it is and not some other one, is the relations of material, that is non-logical, modally robust incompatibility it stands in to other determinate properties. For instance, shapes to other shapes and colors to other colors. We can make sense of the idea of merely different properties, such as square and green, only in a context in which they come in families of shapes and colors whose members are exclusively different from one another. An important argument for understanding determinateness Hegel's way in terms of exclusive difference or material incompatibility, and this is uh, the way that's pursued in the perception chapter, is that it's required to underwrite an essential aspect of the structural property between fundamental ontological categories of object and property, particular and universal. Aristotle had already pointed out a structural asymmetry between these categories. It makes sense to think of each property as coming with a converse, in the sense of a property that's exhibited by all and only the objects that do not exhibit the index property has a mass greater than five grams is a property that has a converse in this sense. But it does not make sense, Aristotle argues, to think of objects as coming with converses in the analogous sense that there's another object that exhibits all and only the properties not exhibited by the index object. That's so precisely because some of those properties will be incompatible with one another and so cannot be exhibited by a single object. The number nine has the properties of being a number not being prime, being odd, and not being divisible by five. If it had a converse, that object would have to have the properties of not being a number, being prime, being even, and being divisible by five. But nothing can have all of those properties. It follows that a world that's categorially determinate in that it includes determinate properties and relations and objects distinguished by their properties and relations, and so has facts, about which objects exhibit which properties and stand in which relations, any world that's categorially determinate must be determinate in Hegel's sense. The properties must stand to one another in relations of material incompatibility. And if they do that, they'll also stand to one another in relations of material consequence. Since a property P will have the property Q as a consequence, if everything incompatible with Q is incompatible with P. So being a bear has being a vertebrate as a consequence, since everything incompatible with being a vertebrate, for instance, being a prime number, is incompatible with being a bear. Since Hegel understands being conceptually contentful as standing to other such items in relations of material incompatibility and consequence, to take the objective world to be minimally determinate in the sense of consisting in facts about what objects have what properties, that is to take it to be conceptually structured, in his sense. For him, only conceptual realists are entitled to think of objective reality as so much as determinate. This conception of the conceptual is non-psychological in a very strong sense. And in this sense, there is no problem of seeing both sides of the appearance-reality distinction as conceptually structured. So we're not, on that account, required to excavate a gulf of intelligibility between them. And for the same reason, the principal obstacle to satisfying the rational constraint condition, and therefore the mode of presentation condition, is removed. Though I haven't said anything positive about how that would go. And that means, in turn, that the semantic presuppositions that I've been, treating, I've been reading Hegel as taking to make it impossible to satisfy the epistemological criteria of adequacy expressed by the genuine knowledge and intelligibility of error condition can also be avoided. Access to all of these desirable consequences is to be opened up by the non-psychological structural understanding of the conceptual in terms of relations of material incompatibility and so consequence. Hegel's term for what I've been calling material incompatibility is determinate negation, bestimmte negation. His term for what I've been calling material consequence 
is mediation, Vermittlung, after the role of the middle term in classical syllogistic inference. The first is the more fundamental concept for Hegel, perhaps in part because, as I just argued, wherever there are relations of incompatibility, there will be relations of consequence. Hegel often contrasts determinate negation, material incompatibility, with what he calls formal or abstract negation, namely logical inconsistency. Square is A, not the, determinate negation of circular, where non-circular is the, not A, formal negation of it. These are Aristotelian contraries rather than contradictories. We're in a position to see that the choice of the term determinate to mark this difference of two kinds of negation, two kinds of difference, is motivated by Hegel's view that it's just relations of determinate negation, Aristotelian contrariety, material incompatibility, in virtue of which anything is determinate at all. And that's as true of thoughts as it is of things, of discursive commitments on the side of subjective cognitive activity, no less than of facts on the side of objective reality that the subject knows of and acts on. That's why, though the conception is at base non-psychological, Hegel's meta-concept of the conceptual does apply to psychological states and processes. Thinkings and believings, too, count as determinately and so conceptually contentful, in virtue of standing to other possible thinkings and believings in relations of material incompatibility and consequence. But our subjective commitments and conceptual, our subjective commitments conceptually contentful in the same sense in which objective facts are, even given Hegel's definition. When we say that being pure copper and being an electrical insulator are materially incompatible properties, we mean that it's impossible, physically, not logically, that one and the same object at one and the same time has both properties. But when we say that the commitments to A's being pure copper and A's being an electrical insulator are materially incompatible commitments, we don't mean that it's impossible for one and the same subject at one and the same time to undertake both commitments. We mean rather that one ought not to do so. That ought has the practical significance that violating it means that one is subject to adverse normative assessment, that any subject with two commitments that are materially incompatible in this sense is obliged to do something to relinquish or modify at least one of them so as to repair the inappropriate situation. But it's still entirely possible for a subject to find itself in this inappropriate normative situation. And that's to say that the relations of material incompatibility and consequence in virtue of which objective facts and properties are determinate are alethic modal relations, a matter of what's conditionally possible and impossible and necessary and necessary. The relations of material incompatibility and consequence in virtue of which the commitments undertaken and predicates applied by discursive subjects are determinate are, by contrast, not alethic modal relations, but deontic normative relations, a matter of what one is conditionally entitled and committed to. We can think of these as alethic and deontic modalities, but they're very different modalities. Now, Hegel is writing downstream from Kant's use of necessity, notwendigkeit, as a genus covering both cases. Notwendig, for Kant, means according to a rule. And he can accordingly see what he calls natural necessity and practical necessity as species of one genus. They correspond to different uses of the English term must. Nonetheless, they're very different modalities, substantially different senses of necessary and must. And the worry accordingly arises that two quite distinct phenomena are being run together and that the attempted assimilation consists of nothing more than the indiscriminate use of the same verbal label, conceptual. And that leads us to one of Hegel's deepest points. One of the meta-commitments for which I claimed Kant's authority is that to be intelligible in a successor sense to Descartes is to be conceptually structured or what on this broadly structuralist functionalist account of content amounts to the same thing, conceptually contentful. Once again, following Kant, Hegel understands understanding and so intelligibility in ultimately pragmatic terms as a matter of what one must 
be able practically to do to count as exercising such understanding. What one must do in order to count thereby as grasping or understanding the conceptual content of a discursive commitment one has undertaken is to be sensitive in practice to the normative obligations it involves. That means acknowledging commitments that are its consequences and rejecting those that are incompatible with it. What about the intelligibility of objective states of affairs, which are conceptually contentful in virtue of, of the alethic modal connections of incompatibility and consequence they stand in to other such states of affairs, rather than the deontic normative relations which articulate the conceptual content of discursive commitments? The key point is that what one needs to do in order thereby to count as practically taking or treating two objective states of affairs or properties as alethically incompatible is to acknowledge that if one finds oneself with both corresponding commitments, one is deontically obliged to reject or reform at least one of them. What you have to do thereby to be taking two things to be alethically incompatible is to treat the commitments as normatively incompatible. And what one needs to do in order thereby to count as practically taking or treating one objective state of affairs as a necessary, that is, lawful consequence of another is to acknowledge the corresponding commitment to one as a consequence of the corresponding commitment to the other. Here, corresponding commitments are those whose deontic normative conceptual relations track, are isomorphic with, the alethic modal conceptual relations of the objective states of affairs. Isomorphism between deontic normative conceptual relations of incompatibility and consequence among commitments and alethic modal relations of incompatibility and consequence among states of affairs determines how one takes things objectively to be. Practically acquiring and altering one's commitments in accordance with a certain set of deontic norms of incompatibility and consequence is taking the objective alethic modal relations articulating the conceptual contents of states of affairs to be the isomorphic ones. Because of these relations, normatively acknowledging a commitment with a certain conceptual content is taking it that things are objectively thus and so. That is, it is taking a certain determinate fact to obtain. And that is to say that in immediately grasping the deontic normative conceptual content of a commitment, one is grasping it as the appearance of a fact whose content is articulated by the corresponding isomorphic alethic modal relations of incompatibility and consequence. That's how the mode of presentation condition is satisfied in this sort of two-stage representational model while eschewing, avoiding a strong distinction of intelligibility. The rational constraint condition is satisfied because if the subject is asked why, that is, for what reason one is obliged to give up the commitment to Q of A upon acknowledging commitment to P of A, something we could express explicitly using deontic normative vocabulary, the canonical form of a responsive answer is because it's impossible for anything to exhibit both properties P and Q, something that we would express explicitly by the use of a lethic modal vocabulary. The genuine knowledge condition is satisfied on this model in the sense that it's not semantically precluded by the model that the epistemic commitment to isomorphism of the subjective norms of incompatibility and consequence and the objective modal facts, which is implicit in the semantic relation between them, according to the model's construal of representation, should hold objectively. And the model also makes sense of the possibility of error, that is, it satisfies the intelligibility of error condition. For following Kant, it construes the representation relation in normative terms. In manipulating, acquiring, and rejecting commitments according to a definite set of conceptual norms, that is, deontic relations of incompatibility and consequence, one is committing oneself to the objective modal facts, to the alethic relations of incompatible, incompatibility and consequence, being a certain way, as well as to the ground level determinate, uh, empirical determinate facts they articulate being as one takes them to be. So the model also says what must be the case for the isomorphism relation to fail to hold in fact. Then one has gotten the facts wrong, perhaps including the facts about what concepts actually articulate the material world. 
Well, in this lecture, I've aimed to do six things. To demarcate explicitly the exact range of epistemological theories that fall within the target area of Hegel's criticism. To set out clearly the objection that he's making to theories of that kind to formulate Hegel's criteria of adequacy for a theory that would not be subject to that objection, to lay out the non-psychological conception of the conceptual that will form the backbone of Hegel's response, to sketch the general outlines of an epistemological and semantic approach based on that conception of the conceptual, and to indicate how such an approach might satisfy the criteria of adequacy for a theory that's not subject to Hegel's objection. Now, the introduction that I'm reading in these three lectures in this series is 18 paragraphs long. I've been discussing seven of them uh, today. I'll discuss about the next seven of them in the next lecture tomorrow, looking more closely at the notion of representation that I take Hegel to construct out of these elements and particularly the notion of error that is at the base of it.